Father, we welcome your presence tonight, and we're glad, Lord, we've crossed over to your side. And we know we have because you crossed over to our side way back there at Calvary and then rose again for our justification. Now at the end time, calling a bride out of Babylon, we're so glad you came down and we've crossed over to your side knowing who is on the Lord's side and we can answer we are because we've crossed over. We thank you for that, Lord, and we live in your presence and glorify your great name knowing that the days are fast approaching wherein all life shall disappear from this earth, Lord, and the bride shall come back upon it. And knowing because you are here, many are wondering what is going on, what has been accomplished, what is to happen if you are here, even as they said many, many years ago in the Old Testament, if God be God, where be all the miracles? And if God be present, then why isn't something going on? But we know, Lord, it is going on, and that is, there's a bride lying in the sun maturing and getting ready, Lord, for you to take her out of here, ready to bring the dead out of the ground, waiting for us to be perfected. Whatever that entails, whatever it means, we know, Lord, in this day of grace, you are going to have to do it because, as the prophet said so clearly, if you demand something, then you must make a way for it. And you have made that way, and we are grateful tonight. May we learn more about it and be more satisfied than ever before, more full of faith, love, more endurance, whatever it takes, Lord, we know we have the rudiments within us, everything because of your blessed Holy Spirit, the living word. We can go forward until we go upward. We thank you for that tonight, Lord, and we know therefore we'll have a blessed time together with the spirit of truth leading us. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> now, of course, we have our questions, and uh, I will try to answer whatever we can in the... Uh, these two services and whatever comes up a little later I have to be honest with you I am having a little bit too much difficulty <clears throat> to actually continue my ministry until the Lord works something out one way or the other however we do have brother um, uh, Hall's tapes that we can send out for the next three months or whatever and we just have to rely upon the Lord so looking at the questions um, there's a question that came quite some time ago, and I never did get around to answering it. And uh, <clears throat> so we're going to look at the question, two of them, which came and said, Do you think when Jesus was taken up on a cloud, and the apostles were told he would come again in a like manner, that, this, that that has already taken place in that his presence has been hidden like in a cloud? Or maybe it refers to both comings since we will meet him in the air. I'm, I really can't say too much about that except for the fact if you do wish to use the cloud as a, a veil or a covering, uh, you really don't need to. And I don't know that even Second Thessalonians, which says in flames of fire taking vengeance <clears throat> on them that know not God. But that would, to me would pertain to the very bodily uh, return of the Lord Jesus Christ. I know one person took that uh, in scripture as he cometh with clouds and um, he attributed to himself and others that that would be the bride were clouds. I have no scripture that I know of anywhere, shape and form that would ever say that. Uh, the Bible speaks of Enoch coming with myriads or multitudes of his saints and they were not known as clouds. I would believe here that we just leave that in the book of Acts as was said that he will come in like manner as you have seen him taken away. And of course, uh, that's just not only true in the sense that uh, he will come that way, uh, but there is the fact that he'll be coming back with the bride seated upon white horses. Now, I, this could be, if this could be a meaning given simply to Israel, uh, I don't have any authority to say that either. Brother Branham said that uh, uh, when the bride is in the palace, Jesus makes himself known to his brethren, as it was in the time of Joseph in Egypt. Uh, Joseph had a Gentile bride. The Gentile bride was in the uh, palace, and Joseph met with his brethren, where he revealed himself. Now, at the particular time of Jesus revealing himself, there will be the nail prints in his hands, and they'll be wondering what he will do uh, to them, even as Jacob's, as, uh, Jacob's sons wondered concerning Joseph. But it was a Joseph said, Fear not, this was by God in order to preserve you. So it is, it's going to be said at that time also. 
But Brother Branham did make a statement that he never did clarify, and he said that Jesus appears in a symbol. Well, I've never known any symbol that pertains to Israel outside of the pillar of fire, which was a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. <clears throat> so there could be a reference to that at this particular time. I don't know. I'm just looking at it, and I would not have any definitive answer whatsoever at this particular time to be helpful to anybody. But uh, definitely he is coming back in, in, in clouds, in a cloud, and uh, at that particular time, uh, it would be coming back to earth, or the other particular time will be simply when we meet him in, in the sky. And I could call that a cloud. Uh, actually, he will, as far as I can understand scripture, that if we are looking at this in the light of, of what we understand Brother Branham is saying presently, that Jesus is on the throne, the Lamb's on the throne, and Elohim is down here, and that same spirit that uh, changes us and raises the dead, that same spirit takes us up uh, to meet him. Uh, it, could, it would be at that particular time then that there could be that particular cloud. Uh, but as the scripture has many allusions to his coming, <clears throat> I just take it at this time that it will be fulfilled exactly right. And uh, that's all the insight I may have upon it. I have not done much thinking uh, on the question. Now the next question is, and do you think that tongues was used on the day of Pentecost and elsewhere uh, where there was the demonst demonstration of the Holy Ghost as a type of revelation since the word without revelation cannot be understood? Well, of course, the reference there is on um, Pentecost, I know, that they were understood because they were speaking in legitimate languages. Now many people, especially Pentecostals, have the understanding that they were speaking in tongues. And uh, uh, therefore, the people uh, from the various areas of the world who knew these various languages were instructed by these people who were speaking in the various tongues of those who were now listening. And, but that's not actually scripture. And Brother Branham avoided that. And uh, the miracle was not what lay in the tongues as though they were uh, different tongues, but the miracle lay in the hearing of the ear where they said, are not all these Galileans? Mm -hmm. See, so therefore the, the thrust would be that, that they were actually speaking their own native language as far as we're concerned, where well, you can believe any way you want on it. There could be a difference of opinion on it. But my own understanding what Brother Branham said, the miracle lay in the hearing where God changed those words so that they could actually hear in their own tongue. said, how hear we every man in our own language, these being Galileans. Now, whichever way you look at, you have to understand that this is something the Holy Spirit was doing, and I believe that these people literally were not so much speaking in tongues, except that people heard them in their native languages, and they were able to get the message. So therefore, what we see here is not simply a manifestation <clears throat> that these people had uh, in order uh, for the word to come forth. That's only what a prophet can do, like thus saith the Lord. And Jesus said the day would come when the Holy Spirit came and they were to, to bring the message of salvation to Judea and uh, Samaria and unto the whole world that uh, they would be speaking in tongues, they'd be praying for the sick, and various other things that they would be doing. So, as we look at it here, <clears throat> it would certainly be true that the bringing forth of the word as to what happened and what is going on is simply them preaching the gospel uh, with the power of the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven as Jesus said it would be. They would preach the gospel with the Holy Ghost and down heaven. And so these people, in my understanding, were simply preaching uh, what Jesus said would follow. They were not bringing a word, but as the question was, was this a revelation of the word? It was an explanation. And in the explanation lay the revelation that this Jesus, whom they had crucified and killed, was the Messiah and was now risen from the dead 
shedding forth the Holy Spirit according to his own word and building his church, starting his church, the church born at Pentecost that day. Now, <clears throat> with that in mind, uh, there are some thoughts that I have had concerning the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, Pentecostals are very great on the gift of tongues and various gifts that are in the scripture. And the tragic thing is they go to the merely the ones of utterance. Uh, they have never had anything too consequential, if anything consequential whatsoever, concerning the remaining six gifts. So I don't know why uh, people would want to have the first three gifts and then disregard the other six as though incompatible or uh, not able to be received. Now, if we could receive uh, the first three gifts, why wouldn't we be able to receive the last six gifts? Amen. Brother Branham went so far as to say that every church could actually be heir to all nine gifts. <clears throat> well, that sure sounds good. I've never seen a church yet. I don't think Brother Branham did. And I'm not saying you couldn't see a church of that caliber, but I'm not particularly interested in it in the light of the fact that the gifts are not conclusive when it comes to Christian behavior and uh, not just behavior, but, but Christian uh, missionary enterprise in the sense that this is something that is truly relevant to the word. And uh, if it were, then why has it not been down through the ages? There's something about gifts <clears throat> that are a little bit not only foggy and hazy and uh, puzzling, mysterious, but I want to show you that they're hazardous. Now, to do that, we're simply going to go to 1 Corinthians 12, and we're going to read uh, to start off. Then we're going to go to 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, to uh, go a little further. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> in the 12th chapter, it says here that um, in the fourth verse, there are diversities of gifts, but it's the same spirit that is giving the gift. Now, when you talk about gifts, the word in the Greek is really energies. And so there's energies or actual uh, powers that you may say that the Holy Spirit himself is able to impart to people. And it's not necessarily the Holy Ghost himself, but it's gifts of the Holy Ghost. See, it's quite simple when you listen to that. Now, different administrations, how they're dealt to people with the same Lord, there are different operations but the same God working all in all. But whatever comes forth from what the Holy Spirit gives, how it is given, and how it is produced in the church, it's to profit. It's to be great profit. Now, you understand what we're talking about? Profit. And when you talk about profit, what shall a profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? <clears throat> it's no good. Again, uh, in vain do you worship me, <clears throat> having for doctrine the traditions of men. So the worship of God is uh, violated, and it's actually uh, uh, not accepted, and uh, it would be then by not accepted an intrusion on your part to try to get to God, to do something to God or for God or by God without being in the will of God. So that's not just mysterious, that's... Uh, a liability, right? It's a liability. Come on, let's be honest with ourselves. See, because we're going to go right to the juggler. You know, there's no point in, in fooling around. See, many people think that the worship of God is the big thing. Let me tell you, God does not accept any worship outside of spirit and in truth. To recognize God is not worship. The devils also recognize and tremble. Saying that you believe in God means nothing. Except when you say that, you're under liability. See? <clears throat> so, <clears throat> all right. 
For the one is given spirit of word, wisdom, knowledge, faith, spirit, uh, faith, uh, healing, working miracles, prophecy, discerning spirits, different kind of tongues, interpretation. All this by one spirit. Not two spirits, but one. For as the body is one and many members, all members, that one body being many, are one body, so also is Christ. <clears throat> okay? With that, we got to go to Romans 12 because we want to bring the two together, as I've been trying to do over different occasions. But tonight we're going to get as definitive as we can, treat the subject, and thank God it's over, as far as we know. <clears throat> I beseech you, brethren, the mercy of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That word is actually sacrifice again. It's not just a service. It's a, he's talking a service, and so therefore it's a reasonable, I mean a sacrifice, so it is actually a reasonable divine service, which is, a, which is it's surface sacrifice, you know. Your service and sacrifice be the same thing. <clears throat> not the same word, but the same idea there. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what is that good and acceptable perfect will of God. Now remember, the mind is a part of the brain. When you talk of the mind, you talk of the seat of the mind, which is the brain. And remember, the brain and the spirit, formulating the mind, work together. See? And then what, that, what happens with that goes down into the soul. And then the soul feeds on it. <clears throat> and then you begin forming your, your, forming your nature, whether your nature will be of God or not. So, okay, for I say the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly, not to think, but to think soberly, according as God did, has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Well, all right, all men have not the faith, so the, all the bride then has a measure of faith, and therefore there is a definitive revelation, because faith is a revelation. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one member is one of another. So here's where you see the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and everything of the Holy Spirit is operative through the body, and it is done in such a way that there is a unity, and there is a profit for every single person. As Paul said, if I speak in tongues in a building, and no man understands me, he said, I'm profited, but he said, nobody else is. So now you say, well, this is given for me to profit. Now hold it, it's not given for you to profit. It is given for the profit of the entire body. As if one suffer, all suffer, one rejoice, all rejoice. <clears throat> so there has to be a unity and a good which is universal within the bride and every single local church. And it cannot be otherwise. See, that's why if you have confusion, in a meeting, uh, a, a believer's meeting, it, it'll go down to naught. You better not even have a believer's meeting if you have confusion. Forget it. There's no such place. There's nothing in the Word of God to give, to, that grants the privilege of confusion. <clears throat> and the word privilege I use loosely uh, because it's, uh, we shouldn't call it a privilege to make decisions that are wrong. We have the Word to help us. Now, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy. Now, the word grace means free. It didn't cost you anything. And Paul said, if you got something, a gift or something given you, why do you boast as though you didn't have it given to you? In other words, then why would you try to use it outside of the fact of the one who gave it to you helping you to use it? Amen. And we saw that in Ephesians. And the limits are, are so broad and wide that it staggers people who could ever be under the influence of the Holy Ghost to submit themselves as a living sacrifice and a service unto God so that the God within them could use whatever talent he gave them. It would be limitless. Because now you don't have to stumble over faith or anything else. Now I'm speaking in the broadest terms of reality that are there. Their brother Branham spoke up as the stature of the perfect man. I don't have it, but I'm not going to quit preaching it. Because, because I don't have a pile of gold doesn't mean that Rockefeller does, somebody doesn't have a pile of gold. You know, William Branham had a great and wonderful life. I'm not going to act as though, well, hey, <clears throat> it's inconsequential. I have to admit he had a great and wonderful life. The most 
beautiful life I've ever seen in any man. And I've seen a lot of fine, fine Christians. So, all right. Now it says here, having then gifts different according to the grace that is given, whether prophecy is prophecy according to the proportion of faith. In other words, <clears throat> you can't go beyond what God's given you. So you might not prophesy like somebody else. You may never prophesy. You may never do what anybody else ever did, as far as you know. Because you cannot extend yourself, or you become tempting God, or putting God to the test. And thou shalt not test the Lord thy God, or tempt him, or put him to the test. So where does Mr. Allen, these guys, go by, and under, under Mr. Hall, whom Brother Branham said, don't you dare write that book on fasting, or you'll destroy lives. So what happened? The man goes in a room, literally locks the door, and said, I won't come out till God gives me gifts, when he died an alcoholic. Tempting God. I'm going to twist God's arm. <clears throat> the whole proposition is of grace. And if you're humble and kind and sweet toward God, yielding, you could go to God and say, Lord, what do I have in my life, if anything? I must have something. You might even want something, because Paul said, cup at the best gifts. Now, gifts are fine. Brother Branham prayed that they'd be on the mantle, as it were. <clears throat> He also told me the age of gifts is over, because why? The gifts looked like the real thing, but it wasn't. It brought forth a chaff. Now hold that in mind, because I'm not finished. I'm a long way from being finished. And you notice I've said long, and I prolonged it. All right. Our ministry let us wait on our ministry, or teaching on teaching. See, I told you years ago, I want to be evangelist. Oh, the flaming evangelist, going to win souls, hallelujah, look great. Oh, boy, 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 that's the kind of guy. I'm way, and according to me, I was way down in the totem pole. I never wanted to teach. When I found out that's what my ministry was, hey, it's wonderful. I enjoy it. I love it. Even if I was teaching wrong, I love it. I don't believe I'm teaching wrong. You trip me up and see if you can trip me up when I'm finished here. <clears throat> now, he that exhorteth on exhortation. Now, where do you find that in, in, in the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians? You don't. Where do you find teaching? 4th chapter of Ephesians. Now we're getting a real mix up here. Where do you find prophecy? 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians. <clears throat> no. He that giveth with simplicity. Where do you find that? All over the whole Bible. He that rules with diligence. Who's that? The one that teaches the word of truth. The pastor and every, everybody in the five-point ministry. They actually have a rule. But he didn't include anybody but the teacher. In this one. Watch this one. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. That's a beauty. Let love be with dissimulation. Without hypocrisy. <clears throat> in other words, let the Holy Spirit in your life be without hypocrisy. Don't try to use him. Don't make a show of it. If something happens, let God get the glory. Remember, Brother Branham was rebuked, having made a side show of his ministry. I never did see it. But I don't have God's eyes. You better believe that, because I thought, I didn't think God made a mistake. I was just appalled. Where could that man, I never saw anything that came anywhere near in my books where the man was out of line, but he was, because God said so. <clears throat> All right, 13th chapter uh, of 1 Corinthians. Though I speak with the tongue of men and angels and have not love, or the Holy Ghost, I am become a sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. And though I have gift of prophets to understand all no mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, I can move mountains and have not the Holy Spirit because that's what Brother Branham said it was when he showed you in 2 Timothy, that was right. I'm nothing. So now we got a nothingness. <clears throat> we got a bunch of people who can talk in tongues, who know the mysteries, and all of those things. Now watch how he mixes Romans 12 with this. 
and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, keeping with simplicity, and give my body to be burned, and don't have the Holy Spirit, it profits me nothing. In other words, I've shot my wad, I've got nothing to show for it. A life that's over. Love suffers long, the Holy Spirit suffers long. <clears throat> that's where you can be merciful with cheerf show mercy with cheerfulness. Love envies not, doesn't want a gift that doesn't have, doesn't want to superimpose himself or take authority and so on, is not puffed up, and all down the line, it says about love. Okay, <clears throat> now, let's just go and settle this once and for all through the book of Matthew. And in the book of Matthew, we go first of all to Matthew chapter 7. <clears throat> Verse 15. Well, you could start here. Enter into the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad the way that leads to destruction. And many there be that go in thereat, because straight is the gate and narrow the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Now that's a straight, <clears throat> unmitigated, unembellished, flat statement. Look out. You can miss it. Few are going to get in. It's a very straight, narrow situation you're in. So, watch it. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep clothing, but inwardly they're ravening wolves. They look just like Christians. They talk like Christians. They can spout the word. They're maybe a million miles ahead of you in what they know or think they know and how they act, everything else. But inside, they are wolves. They're devourers. They're birds of prey. They're predators. <clears throat> they have one thing in mind, to destroy you. Now remember what we found in the scripture. The fivefold ministry and everybody in the church, each one having a ministry, each one given by God, each one separate, but each one under the Holy Ghost, and each one profiting each other. Can these guys profit you? They don't profit you, they want to destroy you. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so every good tree bringeth forth fruit, uh, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. <clears throat> now it tells you right there, know this, that there's no way that you will produce anything that is evil in itself. So therefore, what you produce is how you produce it, and to what end, what is your motive? Amen. There's nothing impure of itself or evil. Nothing. There is nothing that God created that is not good within itself. It's what you do with it. Like Satan, you are perfect in all your ways until iniquity is found in ye. You left the word. You left the road map with what you were given. You left the word, which must be within the framework of the word. And that's not only actions, that's motivation. <clears throat> now, every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast in the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Now, a false prophet, according to Deuteronomy 18, comes with signs and wonders after the true prophet would thus set the Lord. And he takes those, those signs that follow the word and he uses them detrimentally to the good of the people with whom he comes in contact and his eye is on the bride to deceive and destroy or at least to hurt and take from her what she could be building up by using the law of God within her heart and given in a word. You follow me? Let's keep reading. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. And many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? It's, it's scriptural and it's commanded to prophesy. <clears throat> he forbid not to prophesy. Forbid not to speak with tongues. Again, it says here, and in thy name have we not cast out devils? Jesus said, don't you see devils being cast out? That shows the kingdom of God is nigh unto you. They're casting out devils. The kingdom of God is nigh. It's right there. 
<clears throat> Here they sing. And in thy name done wonderful works, <clears throat> discerning the spirits, everything else. What did he say? And I'll profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity, you that are off the word, taking the word, taking the gifts, taking these things, but off the word. Blind leaders of the blind fall in the ditch. Like prophet, like people, like people, like prophet. <clears throat> like mother, like daughter, like father, like son. <clears throat> so you have here an antichrist, anti-word people who are actually cursed and sent away from the presence of God. Right? All right, let's not stop there. Let's go to Matthew 25. <clears throat> this should be ex ex very exciting and very interesting. At verse 31, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And Brother Branham said this was a great white throne. And before us we gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as the shepherd divides sheep and goats, and he set his sheep in the right hand, the goats in the left hand. Then shall the king say unto them in the right hand, Come, be blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom, prepare for you in the foundation of the world. For I was unhungry, you gave me meat. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. Naked, you clothed me. I was sick, you visited me. I was in prison, you came to me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when do we see thee hunger and feed thee, or thirst and gave thee drink? When were you a stranger and took you in and naked and clothed you? When do you see you sick and in prison and came to you? And the king's answer is, they verily sent you, inasmuch as you had done it unto the least of these my brethren. Now remember the brethren, he's in the midst of the brethren, the second chapter of Hebrews, singing praise unto God. And not ashamed to call them brethren because they're of one source, right? I don't have to read it, I read it many times to you. You've done it unto me. <clears throat> now, the gifts are also done unto him in the church, right? Huh? But the seventh church, Laodicea and Chaff age, they're cast out. So what do you want gifts for? Why would you exchange gifts? And these are gifts also. The gift of seeing the naked, clothing. The gift of seeing the prisoner and visiting. The gift of seeing the sick and going there. Those are gifts. And they make a way for the foolish virgin that's not cast out, but come ye blessed of my Father. Amen. You think Brother Branham was saying, why would you settle for the false when the heavens are filled with the real? I would call what I'm reading here much more real than gifts, although gifts are real. But brother, sister, reality, outside the milieu or the context of reality is iniquity because you're taking the legitimate good of God and perverting it. That is the devil. <clears throat> okay. Then shall he say to them on the left hand, Depart from me, cursed and everlasting light, prepared for the everlasting fire, prepared the devil and his angels. I was unhungered, and you gave me no meat. And then, of course, they'll say the same thing. When did we see you? And when did we see you? These same people with their gifts, ignoring the reality, <clears throat> are going to say, look at what they said over here. Lord, we cast out devils in your name. We recognize you. Look what we did. Look what we did. Oh, we recognize you. We made your head. Look what we did over here. When were you around in that? When were you around? that we should recognize you and the little ones. Why, they didn't have anything like we had. We couldn't waste our time on it. We were too busy with the big stuff. <clears throat> didn't Brother Branham say before he left that we should simply lie in the sun and mature and ripen? Didn't he also say what is now left to us is simply a naturalness, a natural living? Well, you show me what's more natural in this life than people just living like godly, sincere people who love each other. 
I've never seen anything in gifts that I would ever really want to desire alongside of this because the human heart screams to be like Jesus, the compassionate, lowly shepherd who became the servant of all. And he warned us that he to be greatest of all should become the servant of all. But gifts put you in a position of superiority. <clears throat> and there is a place for them. There is. But it better be within the framework of the word. <clears throat> and it better be how God wants it. I am not here to tell you that we could have such a meeting. As I've said previously, Brother Brandon said he has a gift of discernment of spirits, should stand outside the door. I don't say to you, I have a gift of discerning of spirits, but I'll tell you one thing. I'll stand outside any door you want to have a meeting and check you out. Do you believe in one God? Let me have your answer. <clears throat> I hope to remember next time to bring a letter of a man that knew they were telling lies about me over in Australia, not somebody you know. Say, Brother Vale, I know you don't believe in two gods because I believe in one God also. And I believe he had a son, but he's got it all mixed up in his mind as to what that son was really all about. <clears throat> he hasn't got him placed at all. Another man spoke on Godhead, and he had Jesus in the mind of God and manifesting in the flesh. That's not true. He was way back in the beginning by God, Christ Jesus. God created all things. Let's stay with the word, not with man's imaginations. <clears throat> See? So here we find what I wanted to show you uh, very, very clearly. So, okay, let's go to Galatians 5 now. And, of course, you're all familiar with Galatians 5, which is the fruit of the Spirit. And he says here in verse 22, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Now, that love, of course, is not the Holy Spirit himself. The Holy Spirit, who is a love, has those various qualities. So, therefore, God himself, the Holy Spirit, is full of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against there is no such law. But there certainly is a law against the exercise of gifts within the church. <clears throat> Isn't there? Well, why does it say let every man speak one at a time? Huh? And a maximum three times. And there's no interpretation to shut up and sit down, close the meeting on the tongues business. <clears throat> huh? There's a lot of difference in what we're talking about here. Now, let's read on. And they that are Christ, notice this, if you want the Holy Spirit working, you're right back to Romans 12, the reasonable sacrifice, sacrificial service, present yourself as a sacrifice to God upon the altar. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts thereof. <clears throat> That's a complete negation of self in the service of God. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Amen. So if you've got these gifts abounding, tongues, interpretation, everything else, and God knows I don't know if they're real. As I told you when, when Dr. Uh, Cliff went to uh, Montreal many, many years ago to a Pentecostal meeting and being a linguist of knowing about seven major languages, he heard five people speaking in tongues. Two were cursing God horribly and three were praising God beautifully. How do you like that? It was all God held with you. No, it isn't all God held with you. There's some devil-possessed people there. And how do you know that those even praising God, he thought beautifully, <clears throat> were speaking in tongues by a true spirit even? Because if you think the, the devil can't quote the Psalms, you have another thought coming because I believe the devil stood here by my right hand, which thank God he's not. But if he were, and I said, quote me the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and I'll stay while you do it. And then ask you what verse is what and to place this and that. He'd do just like that. Amen. He wouldn't have one bit of trouble. Then if I said, give me the revelation of this one that Brother Brandon gave, he twisted. So, you know, come on, you, 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 let's face the truth here. <clears throat> if we live in the Spirit, let's walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another, <clears throat> trying to be a top dog with ministries and gifts. Let's be in the lowly class, forgiving with cheerfulness, giving with simplicity, so the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing, <clears throat> and so on. So here, I trust that we've covered this 
so that you have a, a definitive understanding, and I can't give you anything beyond this, where Brother Branham said, when the heavens are full of the real, and let's face it, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and the will in heaven is the word of God obeyed, manifested by all those who surround him who is God. And so when we're talking about the word, you better believe and I better believe there isn't one word on earth and another word in heaven. It's the same word. And if the heavens are full of it and full of the glory of God, which would be the people of God with God in harmony according to God, who is the word. He's both Rima and Logos. He is God. <clears throat> and Brother Branham said a man's his message, so God is his message. God is his word. He can't change. Then why would we want anything other than that? Then if something accrues to it, then you are able to use it. It's just the same as you've got a car <clears throat> and you want that car to go down the road and you've been sold a car that's absolutely a genuine car to get you down that road. Now you say, well, look, man, it's hot. Well, you can buy an air conditioner. But why buy an air conditioner for a car if you haven't got a car? But if you have got a car, you don't have to have an air conditioner. But if an air conditioner is available and the fellow that has it says you can have it, you can put it in your car. So I'm saying, look, the word of God is the car. The word of God is what God has given us. And there are certain things in there that are allowed and given to us. But you better be very careful that you're majoring in the reality, not that which is unreal. <clears throat> now, with this, we can go to Ephesians, the fourth chapter, just for a second here. And we can see here uh, the very thing that we're talking about. Um, Seven verse. Now, unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, and gave gifts unto men. And he's quoting, of course, from Psalm 68 and 18. And we've been to this. We'll go back again today because it's sort of a, a try to finish off. Psalm 68 and 18. All right. <clears throat> Thou hast ascended on high. Thou hast led captivity captive. Thou hast received gifts for men. Yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell. And they've got amongst them. I don't know if that's perfect with the Hebrew or not or whatever. I'm not sure. But I do know the rest of it. Thou hast ascended on high. Thou hast led captivity captive. Now I said, thou hast received gifts for men. <clears throat> now remember, the gifts for men is a five-fold ministry to the bride. That is Ephesians 4. You can't change it. But the next part says, for the rebellious also. Now, who were the rebellious? Korah, Dathan, Abiram. They rose up against Moses. And arising against Moses, they rose up against God. And arising against God, they rose against the word. <clears throat> and still they had gifts. And they used the gifts that followed the word to come against Moses and attempt to wrest leadership from him on the grounds of saying, hey Moses, who do you think you are? A bunch of us are prophesying. God's not dealing with you alone. God's dealing with us. Step aside. Now, if they'd have done that, Moses would have been an unfaithful servant to God. And he would have hurt the people. And he stood right there and he said, God, listen to me. And this is the one time the man did not lose his cool, but he sure did stand with who he was and what he was with God. And what he was with God by the people's own words. Moses, you go up and talk to God. And when you come back, we'll listen to you as though you were God because we don't want to face God anymore. And God said, that's exactly how it's done. Then they took the very gifts that followed the word and rose against the leadership and rose against God's anointed. And Moses said, if they're right, Lord, let me die. 
And if, they, and, and if they are, they're wrong, let them die a death that is not common. And God said, step aside. And he destroyed them. So there's your picture right there. For the rebellious also, there's gifts. And the Pentecostals rose in rebellion against Brother Branham because of gifts that follow the word. <clears throat> now, he took quite a bit of time on that, but that's all right. <clears throat> Okay, here's one here. <clears throat> uh, did Brother Branham says, in marriage and divorce this, isn't it? Did you know Satan was co-equal with God one day? He sure was. All but a creator. He, had, he was everything. Stood at the right hand of God in heavens, a great leading cherubim. The question was, in what sense or sense did Brother Branham use the term co-equal with God? Well, we got to go back to all the scripture, not all of it. Come on, that's impossible because I don't know all the scripture anyway. I haven't looked it up, but I got some scripture here. <clears throat> scripture is um, Hebrews 20, maybe pardon, Ezekiel 28, 12 to 17. Uh, Son of man, take a lamentation upon the king of Tyre, and him. Thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the sum of uh, some, the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou um, hast been in Eden the garden of God, every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, the topaz, the diamond, the burl, the onyx, the jasper, sapphire, emerald, the carbuncle, and gold, the workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Now, see, everything was, was at that time perfectly created for Satan. And, uh, it, and that means that whatever Satan was supposed to be in the economy of God and set there in the original creation, this one was without a doubt the greatest one of all, <clears throat> and he was given a very special privilege and position. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. In other words, he stood right there before God, leading in the worship of God, and in my understanding, he could have well been a cherubim that, of whom they made uh, images on earth that stood over the Ark of the Covenant. And remember, in the Ark of the Covenant, there was actually only one thing that endured. Aaron's rod that budded was down the road, and the manna perished but the word remained forever. Amen. It stood there. And I, my understanding could well be, and I say well be in, in my understanding here, that's in, and why not? Satan was given a charge. And that charge was, don't you dare defile this word. But there's where iniquity crept in. See, he departed from it. Right. He veered away from it. And at that minute, he was no longer in that position. The same as Eve. The minute she listened to Satan, took one word, she was gone. She's gone. <clears throat> now, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mount of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day thou wast created till iniquity, till you, you, could, you changed the word, was found in thee. Notice, was found in him. In other words, he did it after the naughtiness of his own soul. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God and destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. He's lost his position. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. He was too smart. He knew he could figure it. He knew he could beat God at his own game. <clears throat> That's one reason I don't go by experience. If I were to go by experience and you went by experience, the first thing, your experience might not tally with my experience. You may think you've got more experience as I got, and then you'll be bigger than me. So I've got to tell you all my experience to show you aren't as big as I am, I'm bigger than you are. The Word of God settles it all. Not by feelings and not by experience, just by the Word of God. <clears throat> the experience is 100% outside of us. But when it comes, the lamb or the eagle inside blates or screams to receive it. <clears throat> See, I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuary by the multitude of thy iniquities. Now just a minute. He, he had a sanctuary to begin with God. Now he's got his own. Now with his own, he's gone from bad to worse. 
Now, if Satan is in the church controlling the church, what kind of a sanctuary is it? It's been defiled by Satan and goes from bad to worse and worse to worse still. Therefore, I'll bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. <clears throat> Didn't Brother Branham say that what destroyed the earth at the time of Noah was they'd put off the atomic bombs and things? God didn't break those bombs. Man broke those bombs. God's not judging this earth and destroying this earth. Man is destroying this earth. I mean, you can't get man to stop doing it. Why? Because money's involved. Amen. And now bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them to behold thee. And they all know him. And anyway, the point is we're bringing out the tremendous power of Satan. <clears throat> okay, let's go to, to uh, Hebrews, the uh, second chapter and the uh, tenth verse, what I have in mind here. And it says, For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things, and bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Okay, here's one fellow exalting himself to the heavens and trying to get above the heavens. And God's going to finally destroy him. And here's Jesus, made a little lower than the angels. When it came time for him to enter into a ministry <clears throat> that was outside of leading in the worship of God, to take a place, even if Satan, no doubt, could have taken a place, this one did not exalt himself. This one made himself in a reputation whatsoever, became lower than the angels, and yet he was right there uh, inhabiting Michael, a great archangel, yet knowing that he was in a certain type of heavenly government, <clears throat> standing equal with a great cherubim, Satan himself, and yet Satan having an edge on him in a certain way, which was brilliance and a great, tremendous, uh, creative creation within him. <clears throat> so what does he do? He comes for the suffering of death, and now he's crowned with glory and honor by the, that he, by the grace of God, tasting death for every man, leading many into salvation, becoming their captive, their captain, and now then, He'll be in the midst, giving praise unto God, the Lamb on the throne next to God Himself. <clears throat> so, with that, we also go to Hebrews 5 and verse 9. But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you. Oh, beg your pardon, wrong one. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation <clears throat> unto all them that have been him called of God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So here we find that we're looking at three distinct people, personalities or persons. <clears throat> Number one is Jehovah Elohim, who is Almighty God, the eternal self-existent one. Wasn't born, wasn't created, can't die, can't live forevermore, inscrutable, cannot be seen, eternal God. And then here's his son. And the Son came forth, and He's a part of God. And now through this Son, all creation comes forth. And Jesus, you'll see, <clears throat> with the meekness which we looked at as a fruit of the Spirit, we saw all this vast complex of real beauty and life as it should be lived in a community, one with each other. And so Jesus does not have any problem, God working through him, to make this great and wonderful creature and let him stand right there. <clears throat> so, we find these three. Now, I want to just <clears throat> examine uh, this a little bit here. And uh, the little card that Sister May brought, and we made copies, I know John did, you'll find there's a ninth one instead of an eighth. Now, I, there's one of them, I think, in duplication, but I wouldn't bet on it. Now, just to digress a minute, 
You might not know that Benny Hinn, the fellow that has a great healing ministry in the Assemblies of God, was preaching there were nine gods in one. That means three and three and three. And I think he might have got it from this. Like one, two, three, that's number one God. One, two, three, that's another God. One, two, three, that's the third one. <clears throat> so the Assemblies of God called him in and put him straight. Now, if you know anything about him, he has a tremendous healing ministry, but they fall on the floor. Now, I told you how even uh, Holyfield uh, was healed, and uh, the doctor said, well, we misdiagnosed him. He didn't have heart trouble. Well, that's a cop-out. As I showed you, Brother Branham established the law of miracles because everything in science is a priority. NACL, one of each, salt, salt, million times, million times. Brother Branham had thus said the Lord thousands of times. It happened every time. That's a priori. Miracles are scientific. So never mind your scientists. Well, I won't say what you should do. Because, uh, hey, you might do it. No, <laughs> you might not. All right, look up here. <clears throat> we hear the great Jehovah complex. So he's Jehovah Jireh, the provider. He is Jehovah Rapha, the healer. He is Jehovah Raha, the shepherd. He is Jehovah Nisi, our banner. Shalom, peace. Sid Kenya, righteousness. And uh, ever present, shalom. And the other one is a ban or banner here. However, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> let's look at this. He, he, Brother Branham said <clears throat> that this one here, he was co equal with God one day. <clears throat> now, I think about that and I can't really figure how he would be except in this fabulous creation that God made. <clears throat> Sealing up the sum, wisdom, beauty. He had something that <clears throat> was so spectacular, so wonderful, so powerful, that in this creature that God made, uh, like, uh, what would we say? Uh, like a Frankenstein or something? Well, not quite, but kind of. <clears throat> so as I looked at this thought of Brother Branham, I thought, now, where could the devil line up here? And I looked at some of these, and I say, okay, God is healer. The devil makes us sick. God provides. Devil takes away. Okay, right down the line. God provided Eden, the devil took it away. God is the healer, the devil brought sickness. God is the shepherd, he scatters the sheep. God is our banner keeping us, he takes away all protection to destroy us. God is our peace, this fellow gives us nothing but unrest. God is our righteousness, this fellow takes it all away and gives us a false hope. <clears throat> and um, right on down the line, he's shalom, Ever, no, uh, what is in here? Ever present, sanctifier, and he takes it all away. So, <clears throat> saying that he was co equal would be that every single thing that God stood for, there lay within him the ability <clears throat> to apprehend and s somehow minister or be given a place because he was a high priest. He had the effort and everything else on. Giving, given everything to stand before God, it was all in here. All of it lay in there by God in order for him to stand before God, represent God, and even administer somehow. Because remember, Jesus was doing it too. But when Jesus administered, the great ministry that was coming down here and fulfilling, and now going back as high priest. So if Satan hadn't fallen, <clears throat> 
and Jesus had not had to take everything on. He could have started right here on this side here with equal balancing because Jesus is able to provide. Through him is healing. I am the shepherd. He's our banner. He's our peace. All of these things also there. So when Brother Brano talked of a co-equality, I'm looking at what could have lain within there and something was there that he was, had access to or was within him that followed the word here with God, up here with God. Now he goes into perversion. That's the best I can do on that. <clears throat> That's the best I can do. Just as Brother Branham brought out that all the positive qualities in God, we have the negative. We are the negative aspect. And now coming back with that fullness. So that's how I look at that, and I don't know that I would be <clears throat> too far off on that principle. Now, <clears throat> over here, of course, we have, let us say we have God here, which is central. And from here, we have the Son, and that's born. And over here, you have Satan, and that's created. <clears throat> so, okay. <clears throat> Now, when you talk of the sun, and uh, you really look at him as a son who is not God, but the son of God, <clears throat> you have to understand that God and everything he has, let's represent here, everything he has is standing for that son. But the Son can never become God. There is no way that he can supersede God. No way. The only way he's equal with God is by being a Son, having the inheritance that everything the Father has amassed all through here. He has one half of it. <clears throat> he's entitled to it. Now, that's the law of inheritance. Now, in here, though, we have this tremendously wonderful creature who is in the, sharing in the worship of God and having great and wonderful prestige. <clears throat> now, you'll notice he does not have this here. But there is a co-equality in the sense of these are all part of each other, forming a trinity. Always you'll find your trinity, a triunit, what you really call it. <clears throat> so, Satan must now, with his vast capability, his sharing, like here, there's an equality right in here, and if there's an equality right there, then there's something from him, from God to here, something to here, and since the, this, God cannot give this man, this Satan here, his life, the life is only in here, and there's no way that he can go beyond what he is, and there's no way he can go beyond what he is. God remains God. He's God who never changes, no way, shape, and form. <clears throat> and yet, he's sharing. <clears throat> and you have to admit he is sharing because these are the ones where everything is below it. So there is a co-equality there <clears throat> in the sense of a sharing and God allowing. Now, <clears throat> Satan throws it away. He said, I'm going to even get above God. I want worship. Now, remember, he is not heir to this 50%. And I don't care what he does, he's not heir to it. So what does he do? He comes down to Adam and Eve in the garden. <clears throat> and he gets Eve to mess up, and she messes up the husband, and so they go from God and no longer now are they in control, and Satan is control, and so now Satan has, what, 50%, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. Satan's got the 50%. <clears throat> yep, that's why when he stood before Jesus, he said, I tell you what, I will give you all of it if you worship me. And Jesus didn't deny it. Satan could have given him that 
And that 50% then would have brought him right back here and above. <clears throat> and he said, you'll only worship the Lord your God. Now, these are my thoughts on this subject. Here's Brother Branham brought it up <clears throat> as I go to Scripture. So, now, Satan still controls this kingdom on earth. He kicked out of heaven. He's got nothing up there. But God's kingdom, which must be upon earth with his saints, there's no way, even though the first half of the first resurrection took place in there somewhere, you can't have anything until the full price of redemption is paid and Jesus himself comes and takes this all back. So when I look at the picture, as Brother Branham said it, that's the best I can do with that. But I can see where Brother Branham was saying there is a co-equality there, <clears throat> co-equal. He sure was. He was everything but a creator, stood at the right hand of God in the heavens, a great leading cherubim, and that's exactly right. And, the, and what he could have had was a part of this in the worship and the care. <clears throat> But he came, he let it all go because I don't believe there's any creation or any child anywhere that God has that is not a reflection somehow, somewhere of what lies in God. The very fact of creation has to bring that out. The very fact of, the, of what goes on in earth brings it out. But that's the best I can treat that. I cannot see any other term, be, any, anything beyond what I'm looking at. But, but when you see the, 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 three, the threefold up there, the Son of God and Satan, <clears throat> and you understand how when Jesus said, I am the Son of God, well, then you're equal with God. But he never was equal with God in the throne. There's no way, shape, and form. No, there isn't. There's no way. The throne that he's on right now is merely a temporary one <clears throat> where God is ruling down here on the earth to bring everything under the feet of Jesus. And so therefore, the one bringing everything under the feet of Jesus has to be greater than Jesus to get it done. <clears throat> so all right, that's the best I can do with that question. I don't know that I've answered it too well, but I can see where Brother Branham mentioned this on the grounds of what a tremendous creature that one was. Now, the next question was, then over the next three or four pages, Brother Branham makes Satan that her designer, and he's still working on her today, and other related statements. My question is not unlike the first. In what sense does Brother Branham mean Satan was woman's designer? Well, we know one fellow went to Australia, and he said that when God said, let us make man in our image, it was God talking to Satan. Well, I repudiate that 100%. That's a lie. <clears throat> Brother Branham categorically said it was the son. Somebody told me one time, Brother Brandon said that was the cherubim. No, it's the Brother Brandon never said it. Find that in these 1100 sermons. You can't do it. <clears throat> you can't do it. Brother Brandon's with the Word. God, by Christ Jesus, created all things. And he gives a perfect description of how the Son did it. Having been given birth by God, God birthed that Son, a part of God. And since there's nothing to form him from, when the light formed, it had to form from God. How is a baby formed in the mother's womb? From the mother. Oh, no, Brother Bale, the, the gooseberry bush. Oh, I know you're a gooseberry bush. You're crazy as a gooseberry bush. Let's be honest. The baby's formed in the womb by what the mother feeds the baby. And it comes forth by what was there. That's all there is to it. Then how did Jesus come? What was there? What was there? God was there. So what was the son? A God's son, a part of God. <clears throat> and we're a part of God. Is that right? Now, if you're a Jesus only and Jesus is God, and he's in the booze and the Father, and now one person's got him body comatose, the other's got him absorbed somewhere, you're Jesus only. Where are the Jesus only people moving? You know where they're moving today? I'll tell you where they're moving. If you don't believe that God and his son, you're, you're, you're Jesus only, and you are wrong. And you're reading your Bible wrong. And I'll challenge you to come up here, stand with me right now, and read the Bible. And then tell me it says God the Son. You know where you're going? You believe that? I'll tell you where you're going. You all say, I'm a part of God. And you're going to have to come to the place of the latter reign. We are the Elohim of God. Because God poured everything to Jesus, and he poured it all in the church. So there's no God, there's no Jesus, the church is the Elohim right now. You prove me wrong. 
Prove me wrong. I've talked to the people for the last two weeks. And that's where they're going. We're a part of God. We're a part of God. And you tell me why Brother Branham said the bride around the throne, the 144,000 virgins serving the bride, Jesus the lamb on the throne, the pillar of fire above the throne, and the foolish virgin outside. Tell me why he said it. See, they can't think anymore. <clears throat> They'll be the Elohim of God. Now, I'm not a prophet, but neither am I stupid. Where can they go for all a part of God? They're Jesus only. And Jesus is God. Jesus is not God. When Brother Brandon said he's God, but he's not God, and he was talking about 2,000 years ago, that's absolutely the truth. Is he still God, but not God only in the sense of worship? Because God is a ob an object of worship. <clears throat> Can Jesus be worshipped? Yes. Because he's our Lord. The Lord said to my Lord, who is your Lord? Let's find out. Is man the head of woman? Come on, tell me. Yes or no? Yes. All right, who's the head of man? Christ. Christ. Who's the head of Christ? Well, oh, come on. Then why are you Jesus? How come you're Jesus only? How can you make Jesus God? You show me where Jesus had a mind of his own and I'll eat it. And I'm speaking now in terms of God in that man. Now he said things of his own, but never outside the word. <clears throat> he couldn't. Jesus could not sin. There is no place for unbelief. Amen. Being that great part of the word, how could he? I don't understand people. I don't pretend to understand them. In fact, I don't even want to understand them. <clears throat> it's not worth my while. It's not worth your while. Okay, where were we here? That one we took care of. This over here. Oh, yeah, designer. He's working on her today. <clears throat> well, why not? Didn't he start to design her in the sense of what? Now, listen. When you have a designer... And that designer usually is talked in terms of the inanimate. Inanimate. Dead. So I'm a designer. <clears throat> Let's say that I'm a, a Dior, which I'm not, and thank God I'm not. I design women's clothes. I simply take the fabric and I work out what I want. Because the fabric can do nothing but yield itself to me. Now let's say I'm a wicked type of a person. <clears throat> and I've got a wife that loves me. And uh, she listened to me. And uh, I'm telling her lies, but she loves me, wants to believe me. So I'm designing her. I'm molding her. Did you read in the papers about Carol Channing and her husband, Lowe? She's divorcing after 41 years. He claimed he was impotent, evidently, from what people say he was a homo. She claims he took, molded her, and she felt sorry for him. She took every cent that he had. Women that are abused are molded because men have designs. They're the designers. And that's what Brother Branham is talking about. The women have a spirit that listens to the wrong spirit. I'm sorry that that's just the way it is. <clears throat> And you can't change it. You say, I'm a woman, I'm a sister. Well, thank God you're a sister. Then you're not going to be designed by the devil. But if you're not, you will be. It's just that simple. Women let their hair grow nice and long, and they end up with shorts. Or they'll have long skirts and chop their hair off. Only a sister in Christ can ever obey the word and come out right. Because God is her designer. He's working on her. <clears throat> and Satan has not left up on, let up on the woman. And he won't because the woman types the church. See? 
Furthermore, as Brother Branham said, she's a byproduct. That, that term, <clears throat> I'm not happy with, but I'm going to use it. Brother Branham did, so therefore God gave it to him, so it's a good and right term. <clears throat> she was not in the original creation. In other words, when Adam was made Adam as a he, as a he male, she wasn't right there as Eve as a she male. Made it one. She was in him. And after everything was over, she was the last one to emerge. <clears throat> And with the, and Brother Branham inquired of God, why was this so? Because it wasn't becoming for a son of God to fall. Be tempted that way and fall. So the woman was made the vessel. <clears throat> but the point is this, the vessel cannot say, why hast thou made me thus? If you're made thus, you simply say, what now? The same as the man. And the woman's no different. For the Bible says, you do certain things, you shall be called the sons and daughters of God. In the meantime, the word son in the scripture is a born one. But when it says, holy men of God lifting their hands in prayer, that's male. <clears throat> so there's male and female in the Bible. <clears throat> and you can see people want sex changes. Men say, oh, I'm, I should have been a girl. I, I don't doubt it. So they get a sex change. And the women, and this is better still, want to be males, and I can understand that. Because they always did want to dominate the man, that's like Eve did. <clears throat> the weaker dominating should not have done it. So now you, see, you see sex changes. <clears throat> you see Satan fashioning, Satan controlling, and he's done it different ways. He's done it through science. And by science, he's introduced hormones. And the food, whether you want it or not, the government will not stop hormones put in beef. <clears throat> and when they inject the beef, what does the beef do? It takes on water. It puts on weight. Well, why did they stop that and simply inject the meat with water when the animals did? No, they will inject it with, with what? Hormones. And the hormones will increase the urine content in the, in the flesh. So when the meat goes down to a bunch of water, you're taking urine. That's all you're doing. In plain English, there's urine. And the hormones get in people, they're destroying them. <clears throat> Everywhere you look, science is fashioning and destroying. And yet that wisdom that lies there, see, because God is in education to the point where everything, language and science and all, is of God, in the, what you might call the uh, <clears throat> supine position, which is lying there for the good of people, and science could be utterly used for the good of mankind, but it's not. So there's no problem. He's always fashioned women in the church, and, and he, don't worry, he's taken care of the men too. This is not, not to just for the... For the uh, this is not just for the women in the sense that, hey, Brother Brown is going after the women. <clears throat> He's telling you where the whole thing started and what Satan is still doing. And if you don't think that's true, that she led him astray in the Garden of Eden because of, this, of, of, of the sexual context, what, what's going on today? All you've got to pick up a paper and you'll find woman is, she, for 6,000 years, she has aggravated the condition. <clears throat> And she can control herself, but she won't do it. His brother Brandon said, it's up to the woman to say no. And any woman can say no. But the man shouldn't push it either. If he's a stronger vessel, he's going to have to answer to God. And don't think he's not. Well, we talked about these things, but that's the whole thing there. So listen, Satan is a schemer and an intriguer. And he schemes and intrigues, and he intrigues the woman. And the first thing he said, hey... Look at here. This will really make you something. And so now look how women are dressing. Really make, you pick up a magazine. Man alive, I tell you. Either they look like a bag of garbage or they got nothing on them and they still look like garbage. Why not? You can't tell how many got Im implants. You know, the Bible talks about men being intrigued by women's breasts and don't think they're not because it is. That's just factual. That's human nature. Be there ravished by her breast is absolutely scripture. So let's not fool around. We know the answer. And so they begin plants and all. 
Who did it? Satan did it. God didn't do that. Amen. Satan's her fashioner, her designer. Liposuction. That's dangerous. Everything that's being done is dangerous. <clears throat> Man, I, I wish we just had some decent fresh carrots and onions and things out of the ground that's not polluted. Like when I was a kid. My Lord, have mercy. Piece of meat tasted like meat instead of some yuck. Some meat you put in your mouth. Oh boy, where did that come from? What part of the dead carcass? Oh brother. When I was a kid, the meat was so nice and juicy. And the, 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 you know, the scrapings in the pan, we used to almost fight for them. Lick the bottom out of the pan. Now if you get any takes because of some synthetic junk, you buy the bottle and pour it inside. First decent chicken I had in years was one that I got from Jim. That's just second to last chicken. That tasted like real chicken, and it still does because I made soup out of some of it. Yeah, okay, he's a designer. Let's face it, he's designing just about everything. He designed the atomic bomb. He designed everything. Don't worry, he designed all the new drugs that's on the market today. Oh, yeah, God wasn't in Viagra, man. He was the devil in Viagra. Don't you believe for one bit difference? Come on, let's face it. What's the word source in the Bible? The pharmacist, the druggist. They're controlling minds, they're controlling bodies, they're controlling everything. They're controlling the money market for the time being. Drugs are way better than any type of thing you can smuggle. Right. If you want the big money, <clears throat> you want the big dough. <clears throat> Don't think the CIA wasn't accused of it for some reason. I don't know what all the reasons are, but I don't want to go into politics. All right, let's go a little further because we haven't gone very far. <clears throat> well, I know there's some questions I can't answer. It's certainly be hypothetical. We'll go for this one here because I, I really, I'm going to be honest. I, I don't think I can do too much for you here. It says here, is time gone? gone? Five minutes? Okay, we won't bother with this question then because our time is all gone. And we'll just let that go. And if we're ha ha fortunate tomorrow, we can, uh, we got three, three little questions done tonight. Three parts. I think we've got three parts done. <clears throat> no, we've got two, two of them done. So, all right, as I told you tonight, there's some things I don't have the definitive on. I just did my best to show you, especially the co-equality. And you know as well as I do that when you have the three triumvirate up there, the three, God is supreme, but he's sharing. And you better believe there's certain things he shares and there's certain things he doesn't share because he's God. There's certain things that God can do and there's certain things that God can't do. God can't change. You see, if God wanted to change, could he change? There's no way he could change. He wanted to change. <clears throat> he doesn't want to change. He couldn't want to change. We wouldn't be gone. If Brother Brown said he couldn't have another thought, what he's already had. He couldn't do something to have a better idea. Can't be done. God's God. He's sovereign. Nebuchadnezzar found that out. He said, you do with the armies, the heavens, the earth. Whatsoever he wants to do, no man can stop him. And Paul said, who art thou, a man, to reply against God? See, we can't reply. <clears throat> All right, that's the best I can do. Let we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time we've had a fellowship together around your word, time for the communion service, which we thank you for. And we pray, Father, if we said anything we shouldn't have said, it'll just be blotted from our hearts and minds. For, Lord, you know we were not definitive, so we really knew something. But looking at what Brother Branham said, being satisfied that what he said is the truth, but we don't really understand how he meant everything, but we look at it and see as best we can what the Word says and how it lines up so that we, if there is an understanding, we might have it in part, if not in whole. But we thank you for your goodness and mercy, for the strength you've given us, Lord, for whatever you've given us, which has been wonderful, the years you've given us, Lord, the ability to be in this hour, having seen the prophet, having seen you manifested before us and knowing the truth. It's been so marvelous, Lord. We cannot praise you enough. But we do praise you. And we pray it's in spirit and in truth. And it gratifies your heart. And gratifies us both. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Take the name of